Austin is a senior software engineer at Spokio here in Los Angeles. Um, at one point in time, he worked for uh, what is now YP, used to be AT&T Interactive, Yellow Pages before that. So we worked together over at, at, at YP in a previous iteration of work. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and let him talk to you about Rails, Backbone JS, and some Jasmine. Hello? Oh, cool. So, okay. So my slides won't take up the full time, so um, I know there's been a lot of learning here lately, so I just want to you know, tell a personal story. Um, like Corey, I, I, have a, I have a cat, and that's why I enjoyed his presentation. I, I haven't followed Corey yet on Twitter, but definitely will now because of the cats, you know. Um, and so I, I have a cat named Pam. Pam Beasley, and I love her to death, right? I, I love Pam more than I love most humans. That's, that's saying a lot. Um, and this one time, I first got her, and I've never had a cat or dog before. And basically, I used to have supervised walks outside, right? And I subscribed to the idea that if you have a cat or dog off leash, they're just going to jet and run, right? So it was very, like, closely monitored, like, outdoor walks that I would just take her out on the balcony or take her out on the front of my apartment complex. So this one time... She escapes. She runs. I literally look away for a second, and she's on the back sort of gate of my apartment complex. And she's straddling that gate. And I'm just like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, get down here, right? So my girlfriend and I run into my apartment, grab her favorite toys, like, hey, Pam, come down, come down, come down. Um, and she's like, screw you, and jumps over to the other side. And I have no idea what's over, si over that other side because it's a brick gate, fence, whatever. So I do... I run this quick calculation. I say, like, you know what? Maybe she'll come back. Maybe she won't. Like, I'm just going to go get her, right? So I hop that, that sort of brick wall, and I find her just chilling in the sun. And I'm just like, are you shitting me, right? Like, get over here, right? So I grab this cat, and she's freaking out. She's scratching me. And I'm yelling to my girlfriend over this brick wall. And apparently the brick wall on the other side is a house, right? So it's some dude's backyard. I'm breaking and entering some guy's backyard for my cat. So I'm yelling at my girlfriend like, Denise, here's a great idea. I can potentially climb the, uh, the wall if I don't have a scratching cat. So I'm going to toss this cat over <laughs> the wall. And she pauses for a second. She says, absolutely not. First of all, I'm not, I'm not catching a cat. Secondly, that's just the dumbest idea ever, right? I'm so like, okay, okay, fine, fine. And from the front yard, I hear yelling. I hear yelling. I'm, someone's, someone's yelling at me, like, get out of my lawn. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to jail for breaking and entering for my cat. So I go to the front. I explain to this lady, like, look, my cat ran away. And, like, this cat, who I think is cute, but she's like, ah, you know. And this person's like, oh, I just had troubles with neighbors and stuff like that. No problem. And there I am walking, you know, around the block to bring my cat back. And that's my Pam story. So... <laughs> Every, every conference, you guys come back, or you guys go back home, and they ask you, like, oh, how was that conference? All the presentations were awesome, except that one. That, that's me. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. Um, so basically, I have a side project called Blogmate. It's written Rails, Backbone, and just a little bit of Jasmine. And I just want to tell our story of how that came to be and why we use Backbone and the end product it had. So just a quick... Intro about myself. Again, I'm Austin. I work at Spokio. We're based on Pasadena. I'm a software architect there. Um, and that's a drawing of me. And Blogmate it consists of three people. The left is Ben, the middle is me, and the right is Danny. So me and Danny write most of the code. And if you're asking, yes, Danny does dress like that on an everyday basis. It's <laughs> pretty crazy. So a little bit of uh, precursors. I'm not a JavaScript expert, so you guys are going to ask me some crazy, you know, questions at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk, and I, I just can't answer them probably. Um, likewise, I'm not a Ruby, nor am I a Rails expert. So again, you guys are going to ask these questions. I probably won't be able to answer them. Um, but what I just am, I'm just a semi-decent user of the existing tools that are out there, 
And I'm just here to share my experiences of using those tools and sort of the idea process of how we came across using those tools and the end product it had of using them. And lastly, all JavaScript examples are in CoffeeScript. Um, so if you don't write CoffeeScript, I highly recommend it. So I mean, uh, one portion that we used on Blogmate is Rails. Obviously, this is a Ruby conference, so we've all heard of it. It's a Ruby-based framework, MVC. It's very TDD-driven. Um, it's RESTful. And that's it. I mean, I, I mean, you guys all heard it. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, one other portion is Jasmine. So Jasmine is a BDD framework for testing JavaScript. It's really nifty. Um, it looks like RSpec. So if you look at Jasmine, you're going to see RSpec. If you look at RSpec, you're going to see Jasmine. Um, and also, it can integrate with Selenium or whatever CI environment that you have through Jasmine gem that is out there. And lastly, uh, the last portion that I want to talk about here is Backbone. So Backbone is a JavaScript framework that sits on your front end. Um, and it has a models and views, but just doesn't have the controllers. So I mean, um, for those who have done Backbones, views sort of ride that line of views and controllers. So th you, they're, they're sort of simultaneous. Um, and it has some sort of concept of routes. So uh, routes are for single page applications. Um, there's a framework for that in Backbone. It's really small, gzipped. It's six kilobytes, so there's really not much overhead. And the only hard dependency is underscore. So underscore is like a utility belt for JavaScript, you know, dot each, filters, um, stuff like that that uh, Backbone uses to have nifty things. And lastly, it's uh, template agnostic. So bring your own templates. On Blogmate, we use Smarty templates, but everyone has their own templates, I'm sure. So back in the day when we were first writing uh, um, Blogmate, um, a lot of products will start with built-in Rails helpers, like link to remote or form remote tags or those equivalent that will pretty, mu pretty much write the JavaScript in line or whatever that may be. Um, then as the product starts going well, then they're going to have an application JS file that will you know, start off well because they're just plain jQuery in there, and it will just simply explode. Um, we've all been there. So Danny and I really sat down. We said, like, we really want to bypass that. We really like the asset pipeline that Rails has. So we're going to try to modularize everything. So every view that we have in Blogmate will have a view JavaScript class. Likewise, every model that's represented on the front end will have a model JavaScript class representing that. So uh, enough with the bullet points. Let's get into it. Um, this is sort of a representation of the model pre-backbone. So um, you see the constructor, you just pass in the attributes, we assign it to the class. Um, the save functionality, I tried to mimic as much of active record as possible. Um, I know you guys are thinking like that's some shitty coffee script, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the save will take the, the um, attributes and bring them down and do a jQuery call. If it has an ID, it thinks it's an update, so it'll make the appropriate call. And then on the bottom, we sort of have callback. So after update, after create, we'll take whatever attributes we get from the server and assign them back into the model. It seems simple enough. And then this is just uh, uh, an example of a view. So we have an article view. Um, so we pass in a model of an article. Uh, we cache elements. Then we bind whatever we have to on the page. And then we render if we have to render. Um, interesting enough, Danny wrote this. And it looks almost exactly like Backbone. The patterns he created on his own were really similar to the way Backbone does his views, so that, that was really interesting. So when we wrote our first revision of JavaScript, it was awesome. We thought we were hot shit. Like, imagine programmers, like, high-fiving each other, like, wooing. That, that's exactly the way we were, because we've never, we've never been on a project that sort of had modularized JavaScript like that, that looked clean, that just worked. It was pretty awesome. Um, everything was organized. Everything was objectified. And everything just worked. So we were pretty, uh, pretty excited about that. Until we realized maybe we're not th the greatest programmers programmers ever. So uh, we w got really sad for a few. So one of the problems we had was um, in the view we wanted to handle um, we wanted to handle after saving in the views, which made sense, right? So after you create a new list like what we have here, we want to call the Smarty template, pass that list um, the attributes that. Uh, the attributes of the list to the Smarty template and just append that to the DOM. Very simple. 
And obviously that looks right, right? If your list dot saved, then append the the template to the view. Um, and so this is the model revolving around that. So again, you remember save will take the attributes, make a jQuery call, and then after create, we'll pass that ID back into the model. So the issue we had here was that when in development, this just simply worked. It was awesome because it just worked. Um, but in non-development environments, it was a different story. Um, and that's because our views our views didn't tap in to the callback to the save of the model, right? So that save, the after create, is where that stuff really happens. Um, it passes the ID back. So that smarty template that's expecting the ID for the routes and everything like that doesn't have the ID, right? So in non-development environments, we were sort of baffled. Like, why is the smarty template screwing up? Um, so yeah, so in the view, like our model, our model on render time, or yeah, in the view, our model may have not gotten that ID back from the server yet, so we're rendering a template without an ID, so the links kind of screw up. If you refresh the page, obviously the model is saved and the views just work, so we were kind of baffled for a little while about what was going on. Also, one more problem we had was that as our um, application grew, we had multiple view classes in a single Hamel view. And so, Given that architecture, we wanted to um, we wanted to update multiple views on the single model save, update, create, destroy, right? But we want to handle that in the views. How do you, like we were sort of, this was sort of the breaking point where we came across. So if you have multiple, multiple views like this where a new list actually handles or is actually represented across multiple views, that becomes a problem. Um, so this is just a, uh, a a sample. This is just a sample view of what our application looks like. This is um, pretty much. I have a list. It's called all tech stuff, and these are my articles in it. No VC and how to fix your crappy Wi-Fi. And on the right is my tech stuff or all my other lists on the application. So tech stuff, read later, etc. And so this is how we organize the views in our application. So the top was one sort of view class, the green was another, and the yellow, obviously, another. So let's say I want to get rid of the top article, no VC, why tech memes, whatever, right? So to do that, we have to update a lot of views, right? So we got to update, oh, we have to update the number of articles on the top, we have to update the ar number of articles on the right, and also we have to update the main view of holding all the articles. So um, what am I doing here? Lost my brain. So yeah, um, this is I guess a view that we we had. So we want to destroy an article. If that article is actually destroyed, then remove. But obviously that doesn't work because we don't know at this point in the view if the model has actually been destroyed or not. We we didn't tap into the model callback. Um, same thing goes for updates, right? So if you're trying to save an update. And for whatever reason, the server says, like, hey, there are not enough characters in that list name. We don't know that, for example. So one sort of solution we played with for, like, all of two minutes was, like, hey, why don't we pass views into the models? And so when the callback happens, we just call those views again, doing the appropriate callback. That was really stupid. Like, we sat on that for, like, a minute at the very most. And we said, like, you know what? That's, that's stupid. That really creates a web of code. you got to go from view model back to view. That just didn't make any sense. So that leaves us to Backbone. So this is an example of a Backbone view. This is straight off of um, Backbone.js. So this is a document row. And you can have like default attributes that are optional. So you can set a tag name or a class name. And then there's a section for events. So given any events within the scope of that view you know, that happen, we'll call sort of open, open edit dialog or destroy within that view. Um, and so in here you see um, render. So this dot element means that given the default attributes of tag name and class name, it will automatically create those elements for you. So we're not having to write CoffeeScript or JavaScript to manually create those elements. So what happens is that in the body, in the HTML, there's gonna be a document row 
there's going to be a tag of li with a class name of document row created for us simply for setting those attributes in the backbone view. Um, so it really handles a lot of things for you if you choose to do so. And so this is an example of a loader class that we have. So this is simply for the fact that, hey, we're, we're doing some long sort of uh, calculations on the back end. So on the front end, let's show a loading bar. So this is an example of a loading bar. So again, our view doesn't have to have a model representing it. You just sort of pass in what you need to use. Um, so in this instance, it just has a loading bar and will continually load until it's done. So here's a view I'm going to show you on, on, on Blogmate. That's just this top view again. Um, and then so, and so in here, you see, um, you see the list view. And you has, again, default options that you can pass in. So tag name is one of them. Template, so you can pass in whatever templates you want. And in there, you can say this.template, and you have a model, and you just say to JSON on that. So again, you use it. You use views. Views are very open-ended. We show. I showed you three different examples using three different ways, and it's simply a foundation for you to create whatever you need to create in uh, the Backbone View class. So also, Backbone has. Um, well, th in CoffeeScript, we we uh, have a base view. So. Um, for for backbone routes, right? Every view on the uh, every backbone view has a concept of closing, right? So closing will get rid of all the listeners that you created, just because it's a backbone view, right? So you call on close, you remove it, and you unbind it, so you don't have you know random listeners roaming around. Um, and so in here, we just created a base view that all our views inherit off of. Um, so you can do really nifty things like that. So Views, again, are open-ended. Use them the way you really need to use them. So as our application continued to grow, um, and as we progressed a little bit, we started to make views representing every page on the application. We started to drink the Kool-Aid, as one would say. So um, the yellow represents our global app view. Um, and then in each of those views, we have sub-views. So um, as Pretty much, if, I, if we rendered a partial on the application, we would potentially have a view for that partial to deal with whatever JavaScript functionality we need to deal with that view. Because views, for us, were so simple, there's such low overhead that we just used them all willy-nilly. One aspect of Backbone is the model. So models um, are really similar to Active Record. Uh, you look at Backbone models, you deal with Backbone models very, very similar to Active Record. All it does is it expects JSON from the back end. So you, sub, you shove JSON into it, you're going to get a populated backbone model. And lastly, it, um, it assumes a RESTful back end. So if you have these routes on your back end, for, so for us Rails programmers, this is sort of default, um, then you literally put in a backbone model and it'll just work. So this is an example of a backbone model for us. So our model had a one-to-one -one correlation between a Rails model. Um, and so all that I wrote beforehand, like the saves, the updates, the two JSON, the two hash, whatever functionality I wrote in the models before, it's all mostly handled by Backbone. So now, I mean, when I write you know, Backbone models, any functionality I write on top of the Backbone models are simply functionality that I want. I'm not, you know, just drier code in general is what happened. So oh, that, this explains it. So again. Immediately when we switch over to backbone models, I deleted a ton of code, so it was drier code, less code that I had to write, period. Um, also has like built-in validation, so if you want to put simple validations into the backbone models or you want to push all your validations to the models, there's a framework for that. It's really easy to use. Um, and they also have like all, all those built-in helper methods that we're used to. Backbone models has a lot of those uh, cool helper methods to help us out. Um, one thing is that it's Rails ready. So again, if you have the routes that it's expecting, you just drop in a backbone model and you're ready to go. And faster development. I'm not having to copy and paste, save, updates, destroys from JavaScript model to model. It just simply works. So as long as you have, well, here I was showing just the average use of a backbone model. So I create a list 
and I'm just going to fetch that from the server. So fetch will just grab, um, you know, uh, list dash one and grab all the attributes. List, list.get will actually fetch the attribute from it. You can say list.name if you really wanted to. Um, list.attributes, again, will return a hash of the attributes. Again, this is all written for Backbone. So Backbone gives you all this for free. Um, and then it has a concept of setter. So you can set name, um, then save it, which will update. Or you know your save can take optional arguments. So you can actually pass specifically the hash of attributes you wanted to. Um, wait, wait until the save is done before moving on and then give it callbacks like error, success, whatever. And also, obviously, the destroy. All that is written for you um, easily, and it works, and it's just stuff you don't have to write anymore. So, you know, get rid of all that jQuery that you're writing to get and fetch and destroy, and, um, you know, Backbone Models has saved us a lot of time. So one thing that saved, our, our saved us a lot of time, and this is the sole reason why you switched over to Backbone, was the events. So events are like a global sort of event module that any view can tap into. So here we have article collections. And you know, um, so you can article collect on add will obviously add um, to the view. Or remove will remove. So every view, so imagine if you have like five backbone views, each tapping into the same model. So your model dot on add will each update their respective views without you having to do anything. So each view is separate. Each view is encapsulated in its own sort of code. So you don't need to worry about what the model is doing at all. You just tap into those events. Um, and something new to Backbone was listen to. So listen to is sort of, um, you don't need to worry about closing your views at the end if you just simply use listen to. Listen to will automatically remove those listeners once you're done with that view. And then so one more thing that Backbone has is uh, collection. So collection, if you're coming from the Rails world, is just sort of an array of Backbone models. So for us, it worked out really well because it included a lot of cool functionality that exposed from underscore. So you can easily filter. You can easily sort. You can easily aggregate. All that came for free once you switch to Backbone. So obviously, in here is an example. So I'm uh, populating a friend's collection by just giving it a hash of what assuming is a, a, a friend model. Um, you know, names on the left, jobs on the right. And so in the middle, just give me all those friends where job is musketeer. Obviously, you can probably write the for loop really easily. But using the dot where method from underscore really it cleans up your code because you look at that, you know exactly what's going on. If there was a, a for loop in there, you got to sort of sift through it. That's just more cruft you have to sort through. So switching over to Backbone Collection saved us a little bit of wiggle room. Um, pluck is another nifty thing that's exposed from underscore. Um, just give me, so pluck.name will give me all an array of all the names that I have in that collection. So again, for something very nifty that you can probably write on your, s write on your own. But you know, it's very explicit on what that does. You look at that and you, you know what's going on. So one cool thing that we, we use all the time is a concept of comparator. So uh, a comparator in Backbone, you can write your own default sort method. So in the view, let's say I'm adding a couple lists, like joystick list, animal list, and I sort, right? It's going to sort by the model's name. And that's just a very simple, uh, simple code that you, you write on your own. But you can expand on that comparator if you really wanted to, something more, um, something more uh, complex if you really wanted to. So what that did was that it gave us the default sort method in the model as opposed to in all the views we'd have to copy and paste the sort method or whatever have you. So that was really nifty. Wait, where's my Jasmine? Get into that. Um, so this is just a snippet of Jasmine that we have. So um, you're looking at it, it looks exactly like our spec. Um, you pretty much create something and you assert that something exists. Um, so a couple of things with Jasmine that we found out as learning it was definitely stub your server calls uh, because we ran into that problem very early on. We use sign on. Sign on was literally the top search result and had the most documentation, so it's like, why not? Um, 
Jasmine will talk about fixtures. Fixtures are literally the bare minimum HTML page required to make that spec run, right? Whatever it requires to push that DOM element in or whatever default HTML you need to make the DOM implementation run, that's their concept of fixtures. And obviously, there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, Jasmine doesn't work. I, I thought of Jasmine as our spec, and there's some differentiations between. I, I forgot. It's been so long. But um, And of course, there's some upkeep. So if you change your JavaScript a lot, you're going to change your Jasmine a lot. So one thing I didn't cover was routes. It wasn't part of the V1 implementation. But routes looks really, really, really similar to the Rails routes. Like, there's no mistaking what the routes file looks like. Um, and routes is for single page applications. So if you want everything all Ajaxy, or you know you don't need to refresh the page, et cetera, there's a framework for that in routes. And um, but there's there's a branch implementation that we have. It's gonna be out soon, and I will update the slides uh, retroactively uh, for our finding on the routes. But it's interesting because routes will handle a lot of the things that you think you'd have to handle on your own, but routes will handle for you. I'm sorry, I. I we didn't know too much about it to write slides, um, but we will in the future. So in conclusion, Backbone really isn't a framework. It's more of a foundation. If you would have asked me a year ago, like, hey, what would you use Backbone for? I would have said, like, only use Backbone in your application if you're constantly pushing and pulling model representation from the back end to the front end. But because it's such a small overhead to use Backbone, and because Backbone really does organize your JavaScript really well, it sort of gives you a convention of what to build upon. I, I, I would say we, we try to use it everywhere. Actually, at Spokio, we started implementing it across the board because we've just been impressed of the simply for the code organization alone. Uh, um, that alone was worth it. Again, backbone views are very open-ended. They allow you to do what you do. There's no sort of, you have to do it this way. It's very open-ended. Everything in there is optional. And then the events module was a lifesaver. So again, if you have multiple views tapping into several different models, you don't need to mingle the views all within each other. You just sort of tap in to the, uh, to the events that are happening on the application, and you're going to get that stuff for free. So again, we came for the events, and we stayed for everything else that Backbone offered. We drank the Kool-Aid, and it, was, it saved us a lot of time, a lot of code. Our code is more organized. It just worked really well. And then finally, while we were learning Backbone, we said, like, hey, why not learn Jasmine? We've never really unit tested our, our JavaScript before. And we did it to avoid alert-driven development because we've all had you know, hidden alerts in there, and we tried to avoid that. So I'm going to upload these slides to my GitHub or check out our blog. Um, and then we're going to amend whatever stuff we find about routes in the coming weeks. And then these are just really good URLs that have helped us along in um, helping us learn Backbone. All right, thank you guys. I really do appreciate it.